Hey everybody, here we go with the motor system part two. As a bit of a recap, when we're talking about the motor system, we're actually talking about a series of parallel bodily systems, each of which has a specific motor job. And one of the things that is really important to remind you of is that any of the movements that are carried out by these systems can be planned or reflexive, but as I said last class, we're not going to be talking about all the different ways we could start initiating movements and planning them. Um, we're mainly going to be focusing on the jobs that these different systems carry out. So the thing to, to remember is that the primary motor cortex shows this somatotopic organization. So remember, um, when we're talking about somatotopic, we're saying soma, which means body, and then topo, which means map. So we have a map of the body that's carried out. And if you remember our ugly little friend, the homunculus here, um, we have one of these for both the sensory and the motor system. And they're very similar, but they're not quite the same. So uh, the homunculus here represents, um, at least spatially, how much cortical area or how much of um, area within the somatosensory and motor cortices of the brain um, that we devote to certain body parts and things that we tend to have as high sensitivity areas like the hands have more space and things that are low sensitivity areas um, like the legs have lower space. So as a reminder of kind of the big picture of what we talked about last class, we were really focusing down at the, the level of the muscle. How do we use them a signal coming down um, through the spinal cord, through the neuromuscular junction, um, in order to cause muscles to move. Um, and these movements can control all kinds of things, walking, talking, posture, so on and so forth. So when you're thinking for this lecture about where these motor signals are coming from, what I want you to do is just backtrack from these motor neurons mentally. Um, and so if we're talking about the arm, then this is going to be um, where we're going to come back up to the spinal cord alpha motor neurons that might be initiating this movement. Um, so that's just kind of the main thing to keep in mind here is that everything we're talking about today fits within this context. So when we're talking about the brain signals that are coming down, um, you should imagine that all of these are coming down to some set of these alpha motor neurons, and they're all going to be um, in a part of the spinal cord called the ventral horn gray matter. Um, so um, pretty much all of these follow this same exact mechanism that we talked about last class. Now, this is one of these things that I do pretty rarely in this class, is to just go through lists and lists of things. But there are many of you who are interested in exercise science or want to become physicians, and so it's really important for the motor system that we just talk about all of these parallel systems and what they do. Um, so, there are kind of two major categories of pathways that we need to talk about. Um, and really they're named for their location in the spinal cord. So we have uh, a lateral group um, that we're gonna be talking about, and this is involved in movement of independent limbs. So hands, fingers, face, tongue, and eyes. Um, and so th the things that are independent are those that don't require some sort of coordinated, coordinated movement, okay? And there are times where movement for something like a limb can can be both independent and coordinated. So I want you to think about that. There are sometimes when things need to be carried out as coordinated movements, and there are sometimes where for the same body part you might have an uncoordinated or an independent component. Um, so if you see some overlap, that's why. And then we also have a ventromedial group, um, and this is thought of as being more important for controlling those automatic movements. So um, core, posture, um, and things like walking, um, where you might have a natural a back and forth swing to your legs and your arms. Um, so if you wanna think of um, you know, the lateral group as being sort of the, the independent, almost like the, the free will section of movement, the ventromedial is very much the robotic pre-programmed portion. And that's, that's a bit of, um, an overstatement, but you know, just thinking about the jobs of these two things, it might help you um, to remember them in kind of that way. When looking at the lateral group, we have at least four different tracks that we're gonna talk about. And as you can see here, um, 
The connections for the motor system are pretty much the exception to what I had said about sensory and motor systems for knowing the pathways. This is not tested. Um, but we're going to talk about this cortical spinal track, um, which you'll see is a, either a light blue or purple here. Uh, the cortical bulbar track, which is a green line that takes a lot of different branching projections. Um, the rubber spinal track in red and the cortical spinal track, which just looks like a dark blue or purple here, um, depending on your screen and your resolution. So the lateral cortical spinal track um, is responsible for motor control for arms, hands, legs, feet, and toes. Um, and as is the case for all of these, you're going to have synapses with either the motor neurons, but in this case also sometimes the inner neurons of the spinal cord. And we, we've said that sometimes these connections with inner neurons are important for um, kind of voluntary control over movement, so that, that makes sense, right? If you think about inhibiting pain responses, um, as the example we used very early on of an inner neuron, um, it could be all kinds of things, but that's just one. The ventricortical spinal tract, um, and, and sometimes it may help to go look back at these projections and see, but this ventricortical spinal tract um, controls upper leg and trunk, so um, this tends to be a little bit more sort of central or axial movements. Um, and the reason if you look at the pathways that I, that I say look at the pathways is because you'll see this divides at the spinal cord and sends inputs to both sides of the spinal cord. Um, so this becomes kind of important for um, independent movements or, or midline movements, you know, center of the body kind of movements. Um, and it is able to accomplish that by kind of hitting both sides of the body simultaneously. The cortical bulbar tract um, projects through the medulla and um, it's kind of like this cortical spinal tract, but it's, it goes into the cranial nerve. So if you look back at, at this, it's going to branch out. Um, and these are things that stay fairly near to the head. So this cortical bulbar tract is responsible mainly for, um, you know, face, neck, tongue, and eye muscles. And all of those things uh, mean that it doesn't really have to go down through the spinal cord like some of these other tracks do. So the rubber spinal tract it's getting inputs from the motor system, but it originates in the red nucleus. And so um, one of the things important about the rubrospinal spinal tract is that it's it's kind of getting multiple inputs. So it's getting inputs from, from the motor system, um, but it's also getting inputs from the cerebellum. And so we've talked about the cerebellum um, a couple of times as being a place where um, many you know highly coordinated movements come from. And so um, our forearms and hands are kind of a primary um, thing that this rubber spinal tract controls. And so it, it makes sense. We're getting um, very complicated sort of um, programming through the red nucleus from all of these different inputs in order to generate these rubrospinal spinal um, kind of behaviors. Our ventromedial group here, same deal that the systems are not tested, but you're going to see this is broken down into uh, multiple systems as well. Um, there's a tectospinal system that, that is comprised of these blue lines, um, a lateral reticulospinal tract, which are the purple lines here, a medial reticulospinal tract, which is the orange line passing through, and then a vestibulospinal tract, which are these green lines. And so um, some of these, um, it's easy to remember, like vestibula for vestibular system, um, but many of the others are named based off of just um, kind of the pathways that they've taken and things like that. So um, it involves, again, a little bit of sort of ability to look these up or memorization. The vestibular spinal tract, very easy. The cell bodies arise in the vestibular nucleus, and they use that information to help with balance and posture, because remember, this, this second ventromedial group is automated um, kind of systems. The tectospinal tract, these start in the superior colliculus, um, which you remember um, we talked about um, for vision, and so these allow for coordinated movements of the head, um, trunk, and the eyes. So um, pretty much we're using this system in order to help us track what we're seeing in the visual world, and then we're able to use that information to guide movement. Uh, the reticular spinal tract, um, we have a lot of different brainstem nuclei that contribute to this, and it's important for a lot of different autonomic functions. And so some, some of the things that um, this system controls are muscle tone, respiration, uh, coughing and sneezing. So a lot of automatic behaviors that have to do with um, things you might think of as kind of like homeostasis, keeping the body moving and in balance and things like that. Um, 
but it also has been implicated in at least somewhat in motivated behaviors um, with um, controlling some aspects of walking through um, the flexors and extensors in the legs. So to give you an easy summary here, um, I went into the Pearson and I pulled this table. Um, this should make it a whole lot easier. So when you're when you're thinking through what these systems do, um, you should have this slide. Um, you could even skip some of the ones we just talked about and you could print out this slide and it would put you in a really great place for being able to answer the one or two questions about the motor system uh, that you might need in just looking at what the systems are. The important thing is to understand the difference between the lateral and the ventromedial group to help you, help you zero in on what you should know and you can go from there. So the planning and execution of movements um, is the piece we said we weren't going to spend all that much time talking about. Um, and so that's something that I want to emphasize um, is that we're we're going to talk about a little bit of how this happens, but this is definitely not the focus of the motor system lecture. One thing to pay attention to is that there are multiple systems. Um, that are all kind of at play here. And so we'll talk about each of these independently, but if we think of what primary motor cortex is doing, um, it is sending signals through the basal ganglia and the thalamus, which is the system we think about for kind of motivated behavior. Um, we have systems through the cerebellum and the brainstem. We think of these in many cases for sort of coordinated, in some cases, autonomic behavior. Um, and then we have systems um, going, of course, down straight to the spinal cord, um, where we have interaction with all kinds of sensory receptors, especially those we talked about last class. And all of these systems have to communicate with one another as well, um, so that we can guide ongoing movements. Two of the primary areas involved in movement planning are the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex. Um, so these are involved in planning movement and one thing we know that they do in, in particular is that they are able to um, recognize and help us learn movements from others um, so they can play back sequences of movements and we'll talk about this um, a little bit more um, later in the lecture and then these movements end up being executed by the primary motor cortex so remember we talked about those fixed action patterns in the last lecture and some of the patterns that um, are generated or or that that um, we looked at the, the study where they're generating different patterns in monkeys by simulating primary motor cortex. The idea is that there are some kind of fixed sequences and patterns that the primary motor cortex is able to execute. And so the true planning of movements happens in these pre-motor areas. A lot of the information that these two areas receive comes through systems that you have already learned a little bit about. So um, some of the information is visually guided from the parietal and temporal, uh, parietal lobe and the temporal cortex. And these correspond to the ends of the ventral visual stream for what things are and the dorsal visual stream for where things are. And so if you put these together, that provides these two premotor areas with information to plan based on what's going on in the environment. And as you might recall, the parietal lobe is also getting some of the auditory information um, as well as vestibular information. Um, and we've just been talking about somatosensory information. So um, as we've been saying, there's an important role for kind of all of these um, pieces of sensory information coming together. And in fact, um, the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex are part of the um, places where all of this begins to come together. breaking down these areas um, a little bit more. So the supplementary motor area um, has very specific roles for sequences of behavior. And the reason we know this is the same as for many of the other things that we talk about, where if you have lesions of this area, um, then you ask a um, monkey or a rat to perform sequences of movements, um, which is anything of two or more behaviors. So, um, you know, walk across the chamber and press a lever to earn a food pellet um, in the case of a rat for instance, um, the lesions would prevent these multiple sequences from being able to be executed for something that's been um, learned and could be planned. And the other thing is that um, we now, with the advent of TMS or this transcranial magnetic stimulation, we can do a lot of these things in humans because um, as we explained in the methods chapter, um, there are 
certain patterns for TMS where we can use to either activate or inhibit an area. So if we shut down this area, then we can disrupt all kinds of sequence performance in humans as well. And the last thing that we, in putting all these methods together for kind of knowing how we know what all these areas do is that um, the action potentials of the neurons in these area are tuned not just to um, a movement, but they're actually tuned to a particular part of the sequence, um, which, which shows that there's a relationship between the firing of these neurons and not just any similar kind of movement, but they um, have been designated to control one specific piece of one of these sequence behaviors. The premotor cortex has a really important role in using um, information from the environment, so cues um, around us. For example, if you would normally um, use some visual cues um, that are near your house to decide when you should turn right, you know, the correct street to turn at, um, then this would be the system that would help you to take the information from those cues and use it to guide your motor behavior. And another thing that this system does, probably because of that, um, a similar um, kind of a role is that it's involved in what we call mirroring others' responses. So this is, um, just as I mentioned before, something we're gonna, we'll talk about very specifically a little later in the lecture, but it involves watching what others are doing and being able to um, make some kind of a response um, that matches or mimics. And part of what we think happens for this kind of environment, um, environmental uh, processing and, and mirroring um, is that we use this area for really complex associations between um, different cues. So you get some information about all the things going on around you. Um, and we also know that this is specifically not for um, spatial cues, um, but um, more discrete cues. Um, so very, very specific um, stimuli in the environment. Again, part of the reason we know this is that um, lesions prevent us to being from being able to respond to these arbitrary stimuli. Um, so something like, um, you know, red light is a very specific cue to tell you to press your foot down on the brake pedal and to be able to stop. And um, so the idea here is that these associations are kind of um, abstract in a way. And we're, we're going to talk some more about abstract associations and the different types of learning that we can have when we talk about um, learning and memory. So keep these these areas in mind, the premotor cortex in mind for uh, those lectures which, which are coming up pretty soon here. The other thing that we know about the premotor cortex is that um, it's part of what's giving the motor cortex a very detailed plan. Um, and so this seems to be maybe a final step of processing for um, movements that we're going to engage in where um, there's information about exactly you know how hard to swing a baseball bat um and or um you know how much muscle tone to use when when lifting something or um, exactly how much force you should put on the steering wheel in order to you know make a turn that's not too sharp um, and so all of this very specific information um, seems to come through the premotor cortex along with the motor cortex there are a number of what we would say subcortical or below the cortex um, systems that are also involved in, in the control of movement. And we, I showed some of these uh, a few slides back, um, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, we also have a reticular activating system. Um, all of these also play important but different roles in the control of movement. For the reticular formation, there are multiple nuclei that are in either the hindbrain or mostly in the brainstem, and these have uh, specific control over a set of gamma motor neurons um, that are involved in some things we think of as, as kind of being automatic. Um, one set of these controls autonomic functions for respiration, for example, um, or earlier in the semester we talked about this area that was permeable to the um, blood-brain barrier called the area of estrema that's important for sensing toxins and initiating vomiting. Um, so many things like that that control um, sort of automatic motor functions like the gag reflex for vomiting. And then also part of the ventromedial pathway originates in the reticular formation. Um, and this pathway, at least this portion of the pathway is important for maintaining posture and things of that nature. Um, 
And then lastly, there's kind of an interesting component of this reticular formation um, in, in a small area we call the mesencephalic locomotor region. And this um, area, it was discovered a long time ago, drives um, kind of a generic um, locomotor behavior um, when it's stimulated. And so this seems like almost like a pre-program for um, for a motivated response when we just run towards something or away from something. Um, so this has led to the prediction that there may be um, all kinds of different small patterned movements, which is one category all these can fit into, you know, generic locomotion, vomiting, sneezing. So there may be programs um, for some of these things that are located in this portion of the brainstem and the hindbrain. The cerebellum we've talked about a little bit more because it's come up in a, in a few different conversations um, and it has really intimate connections with the vestibular system which is one thing that we pointed out um, and we also discussed some inputs that were coming from the spinal cord um, and this includes much information from those um, 1a sensory neurons uh, that are giving us information about the uh, level of stretch in muscles, um, as well as information from the tendons and the Golgi tendon organs, these kinds of things. So we get information um, from the spinal cord that's going straight to the cerebellum, um, as well as information from somatosensory and motor cor cortex. And so one way that you can think about this is if you just look at the sum of these inputs that we have up thus far, is that there's really critical information uh, for things about the body's position and the tone of muscles and all kinds of things like this. And many of these are going up to the cortex, but the cerebellum is also getting a copy of these, um, which gives it kind of um, an important role in, in providing a duplicate response to what's going on. Um, and this is why we think damage to the cerebellum causes um, problems with coordinated movements because it plays some important roles um, in driving uh, guided movements, especially those that are very complicated and require a lot of coordination. We're, we're putting all of these different pieces of sensory and motor information together in the cerebellum to help us guide some movements. So part of the way that this is then output that gives us this idea is that um, there seems to be information about both the movements that are going to be made um, as well as the timing um, about how all of the um, different muscle groups need to um, interact in order to perform certain kinds of skilled movements. And these outputs go to a couple of different places. One is to the motor thalamus um, via a pathway called the superior cerebellar peduncle. Um, and then from the motor thalamus, um, they go back to the premotor and primary motor cortex. So we kind of complete the loop that we've, uh, that, that you might think one would need to complete in order to drive uh, motor behavior through the primary motor cortex. And then information also goes back um, to the vestibular nuclei and the reticular formation. Um, and then kind of through these pathways to um, to alpha motor neurons via what we would think of as like a descending pathway. So an ascending pathway um, would be one that goes up to higher cortical levels from cerebellum to premotor and motor cortices. Um, and then there's kind of a descending pathway that goes um, through to the vestibular nuclei um, in the brain stem as well as um, to the reticular formation and then down to the body to alpha motor neurons. Um, and we think that those, this specific group of neurons is important for helping to coordinate head movement, body movements, balance, and things like this. So very automatic um, kind of pieces of our, our coordinated motor activity. And then the last group that we talked about a few slides ago um, includes the a group of structures that we call together the basal ganglia. Um, so this mainly includes three components, um, the caudate and putamen, um, which in humans and monkeys are two separate structures, uh, but in a lot of lower organisms like rats and mice are called, um, they're, they're in a, a hybrid structure called the caudate putamen, so it's just grouped together, um, as well as the globus pallidus. And the input from the basal ganglia, um, basically is kind of similar to what we saw in the cerebellum. It gets a copy of information from the primary motor cortex, and it also gets a copy of information from the um, sensory motor cortex, um, 
But a third piece that's interesting here is that it gets input from the substantia nigra, which is one source of dopamine neurons in the brain. So the idea is we have kind of sensory and motor information that, that are coming in, and we have, um, again, copies of this information that the motor system has access to. But um, in this case, then, we have an extra influence of dopamine, and we can send outputs then back to primary motor cortex, to the supplementary motor area and premotor area through the thalamus in order to um, either change motor output directly or to um, influence motor planning. And the basic idea here is that the contribution of, of dopamine here is one of motivation in some ways. So um, we think of the system as one that's capable of adding vigor to movement, right? Dopamine is a neuromodulator, so it's able to um, modulate ongoing movements to um, help change the way that they're enacted, to increase uh, velocity or um, to increase the amount of vigor with which a movement is done, things of that nature. Um, it's kind of what we think of the basal ganglia for. So it's more of um, a motivated motor system and less of just a pure kind of motor uh, copy um, than what we've seen in these other two systems. So to just give you kind of an idea of the circuitry and a little bit of the way that people think about this is that the uh, basal ganglia circuitry is actually broken up into two um, parallel pathways. Um, and so one of these we call the direct pathway. Um, and in the case of this, this direct pathway, we think of, we have an activation of dopamine one receptors and this sends information directly um, from the caudate pudamen to the globus pallidus to what we think of as being the motor thalamus and onto the um, premotor and supplementary motor and primary motor cortex to be able to influence behavior. Um, and on the other hand, there's this secondary pathway that will end up following with the dotted lines that where there's an inhibitory and kind of a, um, a roundabout way of modifying the system where um, there's an effect on these dopamine D2 receptors, which are is an inhibitory kind of receptor. Um, and these take a more winding route for, through the globus pallidus and then adding this extra structure, the subthalamic nucleus, um, back to another segment of globus pallidus um, before being able to then influence motor thalamus and so on and so forth. Um, the important thing to see here, though, out of all of this is that um, it, there's kind of a, a complicated series of interactions between all of these basal ganglia structures. Um, and yet the influence of the substantia nigra is fairly simple, um, where it's able to have um, a mixed set of effects that basically change how all of the other motor information is processed through this pathway. So this effect is kind of consistent with um, what I was saying before. There's a modulatory role where the substantia nigra is able to um, act as um, both a brake pedal um, as well as an accelerator for determining how this motor information is processed in a motivated behavior. So just to summarize a little bit of what's there, there, um, there are two pathways, a direct um, and an indirect. Um, there's also some people consider this hyperdirect pathway. I'm not putting any focus or emphasis on that. It's more than you need to know. Um, and these basal ganglia pathways have these um, what we would call re-entrant loops where they connect back into the cortex and the information comes back down from the cortex. Um, as we saw, that's a primary input and then is processed through the system and then gets back to the motor system. Um, we also said that the caudate or caudate and putamen um, is basically an area where sensory and motor information can be integrated. So this helps us to understand what's going on in the sensory system and the motor system. Um, and this allows us to monitor ongoing movements, um, including um, what the muscles are doing, body position, so on and so forth. Um, and we're also getting information about the movements that are planned um, from the premotor and the motor cortex. And what this allows the dopamine system to then do is to take all this information that we just mentioned and change the way that that movement um, might happen. So if you are normally walking down the street and then you see a big 
dog behind you, then you would have the ability to sort of invigorate, you know, your walking movement and change the speed at which you walk and so on and so forth. Um, and this seems to be the level of, of control, or at least the type of control that the basal ganglia um, circuitry exerts. And one interesting thing that um, is kind of important for this idea of sensory and motor integration and things like that is that um, the basal ganglia still has the somatotopic map that both the sensory, the somatosensory system and the motor system have. So um, it puts it pretty squarely um, as almost like a hybrid between the two where it's, it's again, taking information about sensory and motor and then using that to modulate um, output, uh, behavioral output. Some of the information about this sensory motor mapping um, actually comes uh, directly from work here at Rutgers University. So I, I always think when I can, especially if it's something in psychology that I'd like to um, you know, promote this information. But Dr. Mark West, who teaches the other physio psych class most often, um, was among the first to kind of record this information. And they used um, single unit recordings, if you remember from the methods chapter, to record action potentials. And what they found is that there are different locations, um, basically something kind of like a homunculus in the caudate putamen, where certain areas are responsive to the um, certain specific body parts, like a hind limb or a forelimb or the trunk and shoulder and neck, the vibrissae of the rat they were recording from, the whiskers. Um, and if you, if you look at the lines here, there are different maps of where they were driving an electrode down. So um, some of these being a little bit um, more forward or backward in the brain and also medial versus lateral. And then the dropping down these lines represents depth. Um, and so they found um, kind of a mapping that exists in this area. And that, again, was all work done here at Rutgers, um, the better part of a couple of decades ago. One disease with a very strong relationship to the basal ganglia is Parkinson's disease, um, which I think uh, many of you know involves some um, difficulty with movement that can include, can include things like um, muscle rigidity um, or tremors. And there, when we talk about Parkinson's disease now, of course, there are things that fit directly into this category, but there are also a, num a number of similar diseases we would put under um, Parkinson's-like disorders are sometimes called Parkinsonianism, um, where they also match these same features. And so Parkinson's disease itself, um, we know results from damage to dopamine neurons, um, and especially those that are part of the basal ganglia that come from a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Part of the reason that we know the importance of these dopamine neurons is that treatments for Parkinson's um, that were found to be effective very early on involved um, the restoration of dopamine. So probably the longest running treatment um, is L-DOPA or Levodopa, um, which is kind of a precursor to dopamine. So it's part of the dopamine synthesis pathway, and it happens to be a drug that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, so restoring overall dopaminergic tone um, can help somewhat with Parkinson's disease. Um, and um, some of the newer treatments um, involve even um, transplants of things like pluripotent stem cells um, in order to restore more dopamine secreting neurons. Um, and also in some cases, um, manipulations that affect the um, different portions of the direct or the indirect pathway um, that help to um, alleviate some of kind of the scrambled um, information that's coming through in the absence of dopamine um, by giving um, or producing lesions in the globus pallidus or adding stimulating um, electrodes into the subthalamic nucleus. Um, so all of these involve kind of corrections of the basal ganglia. And one interesting fact that happens with Parkinson's disease that um, also suggests that the main role of the basal ganglia is in um, is in invigorating specific kind of behaviors um, is that there have long been stories about individuals with Parkinson's disease that have trouble um, with movement, um, except under a circumstance that um, is, is kind of dangerous or dire. Um, so an example of this would be somebody that might have difficulty with normal movements. Um, and yet, um, if there's something like a, a house fire 
um, that all of a sudden movement for a short period of time when it's, um, you know, a, a high stress in, um, situation where there's a lot of um, dopaminergic, an increase in dopaminergic signaling um, due to the, the need for this sort of excess amount of vigor with the movement, that movements for a short period of time are restored to kind of a normal or a pseudo normal function. Um, and then these individuals go straight back to kind of normal Parkinsonian traits um, after that. So um, this just shows that there, you know, even in an individual where the function has been affected um, and maybe the system is functioning poorly, that we can still get back to normal behavior for moments of time um, when a highly motivated behavior is required. Um, Huntington's disease is another one that I mentioned briefly, um, although I don't expect you to remember this because it's a little less um, relevant to what we, we've been talking about, um, is also another um, disease that affects movement. Um, and in this case, um, the effect is most mostly on the caudate nucleus. So again, part of the motor system, which explains um, these problems with movement itself. Um, and this is actually um, linked has now been linked to um, hereditary um, problems on the chromosome four, um, which which causes problems with the disease that we now call Huntington, of course, named after the disease that um, is creating the problems with the way that the um, caudate nucleus is signaling. So one of the last things that we're going to talk about is just how we get to more complicated movements. Um, and this is the point where I don't want to say we've hit the, we, we hit the limit of what we understand, but um, it becomes very difficult to study things that are more complicated in a way that's, um, that's experimentally controlled. And so uh, part of what we have to do is take information from everything else we've learned and we need to then apply it to think a little bit about how we can learn, accomplish, and carry out complicated movements. One of the things that we've mentioned a few times today is that um, we have a system that nobody really expected to exist, um, which is that um, our bodies have a system filled with neurons that we call mirror neurons. Um, so these are neurons that are found in the ventral premotor cortex. Um, in also parts of the inferior um, parietal lobe. And these neurons are probably meant to be important for understanding and learning about our own body in space by um, seeing our own body parts move. For example, you'll remember that when we talked about the visual system, we talked about specific areas that are involved in um, recognizing faces, but also another um, area of the visual system that's important for recognizing body parts. And the idea of these mirror neurons that we see here um, in, in the motor system is that um, these neurons respond when somebody else is making some kind of a movement. And they respond in a way that's as if the individual were performing this movement themselves. Um, so the idea is that we can look at movements that are being performed and that we have an inherent system um, for processing the sequence of movements that need to happen in order for us to reproduce this. And I would guess, um, although I haven't looked at this explicitly, that people that have a lot of practice doing this, uh, for example, dancers that follow choreography, um, would be one example that you end up getting better and better at being able to imitate movements the more that you practice. Um, but the whole idea is we have a built-in playback system where something that we observe is then something that we can um, use to generate a, a motor program for ourselves. And this means that these neurons, of course, are important for some sort of imitation learning. Um, and this allows us to pick up new motor skills from the moment that we're born. These neurons allow us to um, mimic the mouth movements of parents as we're learning to talk and to mimic um, the way that you know others walk and move around and perform all kinds of actions. 
Another thing that's gotten a little bit more interesting with these mirror neurons is that they are not just responsive to actions, though. And we talked about how um, part of the job of the motor system is using um, external cues. And it seems that mirror neurons are not only responsive to specific movements, but um, that they also have enough information coming through all sorts of polysensory systems um, to have specific firing patterns that might also underlie something as detailed as intention. Um, so the example in the figure here is fairly simple, where depending on the context, whether or not you see um, a meal that is laid out and then somebody bringing in a cup as a part of that meal, or if we see a messy table and we see the hand in the same spot without ever actually seeing whether the hand is coming and going, um, when looking at this hand, in one case, we think of the intention as being reaching down to take a drink, and in another case, reaching down to clean up the cup. Um, so depending on what the circumstance is, we might have a completely different set of these mirror, mirror neurons firing. Another way that we accomplish very complicated movements is through the integration of sensory information and the use of multiple sensory systems. For example, if we take something as simple as the reaching behavior that we were just talking about, we have visual information from the dorsal stream that helps us to determine the location of an object, um, um, as well as if there's any movement of that object happening. Um, we also have information from the ventral stream telling us what the object is. Um, and we even have certain areas where we use these behaviors so often that they're almost wholly dedicated to that task. So um, we know that, for example, the information at the end of the visual stream, um, as well as information um, in the frontal lobe, are critical for reaching, so much so that we have an area called the parietal reach region, which seems to be very critical for taking all of these different pieces of information and putting them together. Um, you know, where the object is, what it is, what size it is, um, and then this interacts with the motor system in how we, in guiding how we should move our hand and reach out in order to be able to um, produce the exact movement that we would need in order to accurately reach out and either pick up the object or manipulate it or do any of those kind of things. In thinking about complicated movements, one thing that we um, should really mention are that there are um, part of the reason we know about that this polycentric information is so important are because of the number of different apraxias. Um, one of these is known as limb apraxia, and this comes about if you ask someone to make a very specific kind of movement, and what they end up doing is a wholly inappropriate movement. So the information that should follow through from other senses, for example, being told, um, you know, raise your arm and move it to the right, um, will then cause the person to um, somehow incorrectly perform this movement because they're unable to take that information about um, the auditory you know, information that's just come in of, of a movement command and convert it directly into the right kind of movement. Um, and this seems to, um, this limb apraxia in specific um, comes about after parietal damage, especially to the left parietal cortex, um, which, we, which we think of as being pretty important for processing kind of the um, extra personal space um, or or involved in as we said in the sensory lecture um, or the somatosensory lecture I should say um, in proprioception um, so knowledge of where we are in our own space and then how our our body relates to the um, space around us another example is constructional apraxia um, where individuals have trouble um, with geometrical um, constructions and relationships. Um, and this seems to be a similar but somewhat different um, kind of an apraxia um, where, again, there's some problem with spatial relationships. Um, but in this case, we have damage to the right parietal lobe. Um, and so, again, this is a, a similar but um, measured in a different way where somebody has an inability to 
you know, draw specific pictures and diagrams because they're unable to use some of this information together and convert it into a motor plan, which is the commonality between these two. And so these are really oversimplifications, but they're examples of just ways in which um, the information is grouped and where it is in the brain and gives us an idea of how we get to these complicated behaviors where um, even just specific pieces of the parietal lobe um, for um, taking information about what movement was we were told to perform and being able to perform it um, or trying to take information we have from a sensory system um, for example a picture and then being able to use that to draw our own picture um, these all kind of happen in the parietal lobe where there's all this polysensory information coming together to give us an idea of how all of the information from our senses relates to the world and then to pass this into um, a specific motor plan within the motor system and with that, we've hit the end of another lecture. Um, I just want to end on one kind of last thought, though, which is that those of you that have really taken the time to dive into this are probably a little bit unsatisfied with the way that this lecture portrays or, or you know, tells you about the way that we perform complex actions. And so what I want to point out is that the lecture gives you a blueprint. It tells you that the brain knows a map of the body. It tells you that you know, if you think back to the visual system and other things like that, we have ways that we integrate sensory information to give us a map of our world, you know, what things are and where they are. And then we have parts of the brain that think about planning and guiding movement. And so the ways that we put all of that together are kind of infinite. And this is really where thinking about the brain gets to the level of abstraction that, that's very difficult. The brain is complex and the movements that we're asking it to execute or plan to execute are also very complex. And so this requires a system that is flexible and versatile, and that's exactly what the brain is. So, you know, if, if you're left a little bit unsatisfied, I wanna just point out to you that what we've done is we've, we've given you all the parts to, to kind of build the system and, and explain how it might execute things. Um, and then we reach this level where it's very difficult to explain it in detail. So if you have specific questions, as always, feel free to stop by office hours. But otherwise, um, I will see you next time after the quiz this upcoming class. Have a good one.